Chapter 5. The Believer. Last Will and Testament. I know this is probably a creepy way to start an 8th grader's will, but happiness is as fragile and fleeting as a bubble of soap. The one person I loved in the whole world died, and then that night when I got in the bath there was no more shampoo. Life is pretty much like that. But when I put a little water in the empty bottle and shook it, it filled up with these tiny bubbles. That's when it hit me. That was me. Water down the last dregs of happiness and turn them into bubbles to fill the void. It may be nothing more than an illusion, but it was still better than the emptiness. I planted a bomb at school today, the 31st of August. It's rigged to go off when I push the send button on my phone. I got another phone with a different number and had built it into the bomb as the trigger. When it rings, the vibration sets off the blast. So actually you could set it off from any phone, if you knew the number, or even if you got a wrong number, you'd have about 5 seconds and then dot kaboom. The bomb is under the podium on the stage in the gym. There's an all school assembly tomorrow to mark the end of the second term, and they're going to announce that an essay I wrote won top prize in a prefectural competition. My homeroom teacher, Tarada, told me yesterday how the program was supposed to go. I'll go up on the stage to receive a certificate, and then I'll go to the podium and read the essay. But they're in for a surprise. Instead of the essay, I'm going to give them some parting words and then detonate the bomb. I'll be blown to tiny bits, and I'll take all those worthless idiots with me. There's never been a child crime like this before, and I bet the TV and the newspapers will eat it up. I wonder what they'll say about me. I suppose they'll talk about my inner demons and use all the usual cliches. But even if the descriptions in the media are totally unrealistic, I hope this website, what I'm writing here, gets out just as it is. My one regret is that the newspapers won't use my real name because I'm a minor. But I wonder what it is that the public really wants to know about a criminal. His background or his hidden psychological problems. Or maybe his motive for committing the crime. Well, if that's what they want, I'll start with that here. I understand why murder is considered a crime. But I don't necessarily understand why it's evil per se. Human beings are just one among an infinite number of entities, living or otherwise, that exist on the earth. If obtaining some sort of benefit for one being necessitates the elimination of another, then so be it. But that belief didn't prevent me from writing an essay on the meaning of life that was better than anyone else's in the class, better than any other middle school kids in the prefecture. I began by quoting Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, Extraordinary people have the right to violate conventional morals in order to bring something new into the world. But I argued against that idea, saying that life is precious and that under no circumstances could murder be justified. I even dumbed it down enough to sound like a middle school kid. The whole thing took less than a half hour to crank out. But what's the point? That kind of conventional morality is nothing more than a lesson in school. I suppose there are some people who have an instinctive aversion to murder. But in a country like Japan, where religion doesn't count for much, I suspect most people have been taught to value life above all else. And yet those same people also support the death penalty in the case of particularly brutal crimes without seeing the inconsistency in their own position. However, on a few rare occasions someone will come forward to counter this logic and argue that a murderer's life is just as valuable as one's own, regardless of status or station. But what kind of upbringing results in that sort of sensibility? I suppose it would come from a childhood where someone whispered fairy tales about the precious value of life in your ear every night before bed, if there are any such fairy tales. And if that were the case, I suppose I could understand ending up with that kind of attitude even though it couldn't be further from my own feelings. Because, you see, my own mother never once in my life told me a fairy tale. She did put me to bed at night, but instead of telling me stories, she talked about electrical engineering. Current, voltage, Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law, Thevenin's theorem, Norton's theorem. My dream was to become an inventor to create a machine that did something new, extracted cancer cells, anything at all. 
That's how the stories my mother told always ended. Our values are determined by the environment we grow up in, and we learn to judge other people based on a standard that's set for us by the first person we come in contact with, which in most cases is our mother. So, for example, a person who has been raised by a cruel mother might find another person, let's call him a, might find A to be a kind person. But another person who was raised by a very kind mother might find A to be cruel. At any rate, my mother has always served as my basis for judging other people, and I have never yet met anyone who was as extraordinary as she is. Which means that I would have no regrets about the death of any of the other people around me. Unfortunately, that even includes my father. He's nice and cheerful, fine for the owner of a small town electronics store, but that's about it. I don't hate him, but I don't think it matters whether he lives or dies. Even the smartest person can go through a bad period in her life, a time when, through no fault of her own, she has the bad luck to be taken in by someone else. My mother was in the middle of such a period of weakness when she met my father. She had been living overseas and came back to do a doctorate in electrical engineering at a top-ranked university, but she had run into a snag in her research just as it was reaching the final stages. Right around the same time, she was in an accident. She was taking an overnight bus on her way home from a conference at our local university when the driver fell asleep at the wheel and crashed into an embankment. There were a dozen or so fatalities and many more injuries. My mother was thrown from the bus and suffered a major head contusion. She was loaded onto the first ambulance to arrive at the scene, and the patient on the other stretcher turned out to be my father. He had been on his way to the wedding of a college friend. They were married soon afterward, and had me. Or perhaps it was the reverse. Having finished her doctoral studies, my mother abandoned her research, ignored her genius, and came here to live in this dead-end town. You could think of the time she spent here as a form of rehabilitation. She spent her days in a corner of my father's electronics store in a tired shopping district at the edge of town finding ways to explain just a tiny bit of what she knew to her little boy. One day she might take the back off of an alarm clock. The next, she would take apart a TV all the while telling me that there was no limit to the things that might be discovered in the future. You're a very smart boy, Shuya. I'm counting on you to accomplish the things I was never able to. She would often tell me this as she looked for ways to explain her abandoned research project to a child who was barely in elementary school and perhaps she had a flash of inspiration while she was repeating the details. At any rate, she wrote a new academic paper without telling my father and submitted it to a conference in the United States. That was when I was nine years old. Not long afterward, a professor from her old research lab came to persuade her to return to the university. I overheard their conversation from the next room, and I remember being so happy that someone who understood and valued my mother had come that I wasn't even particularly worried about her going away. But she turned him down. She said she would have gone if she'd been single, but that she was a mother now and couldn't leave her child to go back to her research. It was a shock to realize I was the reason she had to refuse. I was holding her back. It wasn't just that I was a worthless kid. I was actually denying worth to the person I loved most. When people talk about overwhelming regret, it's usually just a figure of speech, but I believe that my mother experienced exactly that. All the feelings that she had suppressed came out, and they were directed solely at me. If it weren't for you, she would say as she began to beat me almost every day. She hardly needed an excuse. I hadn't eaten all my vegetables, I'd missed one problem on a test, I had slammed the door. In the end, it was the very fact of my existence that she couldn't stand. But every time she hit me, I could feel a void opening wider and wider inside. It never occurred to me to tell my father what she was doing. As I've said, I didn't hate him, but I had resigned myself to my mother's decision, and the longer I went on fooling him and pretending nothing was happening, the more I came to feel superior to him. On the other hand, no matter how swollen my cheeks got or how many bruises I had on my arms and legs, I never felt any hatred for my mother. 
If she'd had a particularly violent outburst during the day, she would always come to my room at night and stroke my head while I pretended to be asleep. There were tears in her eyes as she whispered how sorry she was. How could I have hated her? After she left my room, I would cry myself to sleep, my face pressed into the pillow to stifle my sobs. It was too painful to realize that the one person in the world I loved was suffering by the very fact of my existence. It was during that period that I first started thinking about death. If I were dead, my mother would be able to fully demonstrate her genius and finally fulfill her dream. Every suicide scenario I could think of began running through my head. Jumping in front of a truck out on the highway. Throwing myself off the roof of the elementary school. Stabbing myself in the heart. But all of them seemed ugly and unappealing. I remembered how my grandmother had died the year before at the hospital, almost as if she'd just gone to sleep, and I began to wish I could contract some disease. While I was desperately trying to come up with a way to die, my parents finalized their divorce. I was 10 years old. My father had at last realized that my mother was abusing me. It seemed that one of the other shop owners had told him. My mother put up no defense, saying she would move out as soon as the divorce came through. I understood that I couldn't go with her, but nevertheless I cried as if my body were being ripped apart, and when I was done, I was finally completely empty inside. After my parents decided to divorce, my mother never hit me again. On the contrary, she took to gently stroking my cheek or forehead at random moments throughout the day. She made all my favorite foods, cabbage rolls, potatoes au gratin, rice omelettes, and her genius showed in the kitchen, too. Her versions were better than any restaurants. Today before she left, we went out together for the last time. She asked me where I wanted to go, but a flood of tears prevented me from answering. In the end, we went to a new shopping center called Happy Town that had just opened out by the highway. She bought me several dozen books and the latest game player. She had me pick out all the games for the player I wanted, perhaps hoping that these would help me through the lonely days ahead. But she chose the books herself. These are probably a bit old for you now, but I want you to read them when you get to middle school. Each one of them had a big effect on me when I was growing up. With my blood flowing in your veins, I'm sure they'll be important for my shuya, too. Dostoyevsky, Turgenev, Camus. No, any of them looked very interesting at the time, but I didn't care. It was enough that I had her blood flowing in my veins. For our final dinner together, we ate hamburgers at a fast food place. She had suggested going to a nice restaurant, but I thought somewhere more starkly lit and unbearably loud might help me to keep me from crying. We had a delivery service ship the things she bought and decided to walk home despite the distance. She held my hand in hers, the hand that could do such amazing work with a screwdriver, or make delicious hamburgers, or slap my face ruthlessly and then pet me just as gently. I had never known until that moment how much could be communicated through the hands. But I had reached my limit. My tears flowed harder with every step we took as I used my free hand to wipe them away. Shuya, you know I've had to promise that I won't come see you, or call, or even write to you. But I'll be thinking about you all the time. Even though we're going to be apart, you will still be my one and only child. If anything should happen to you, I'll forget about the promise and come running to find you. And Shuya, I'm hoping you won't forget about me. She was crying, too. Will you really come? Instead of answering, she stopped and folded me in her arms. That was the last moment of happiness for her empty boy. My father remarried the following year. I had turned 11. His new wife, someone he had known in middle school, was pretty enough but she was also impossibly dumb. Here she was marrying the owner of an electronics store, and she couldn't even tell the difference between A and AAA batteries. Still, I found I didn't really hate her. Mostly because she didn't pretend. She was fully aware how stupid she was. When she didn't know something, she just said so. 
If a customer asked her a difficult question, she would make careful note of it and then ask my father before calling back with the answer. There was something admirable in this kind of stupidity. I took to calling Hamiyuki-san, and the respect was genuine. I never once talked back to her or treated her like an evil stepmother, the way kids on those cheesy TV shows do. On the contrary, I was the model stepchild, finding a designer bag for her cheap on the internet or going along with her to carry the grocery bags when she went shopping for dinner. I didn't even mind when she showed up for parents' day at school. I hadn't mentioned it to her, but she must have heard from one of the other shopkeepers. Anyway, there she was, all dolled up and right in the middle of the front row. When I was at the blackboard solving some arithmetic problem that was too hard for the other kids, she took my picture with her phone, and then she showed it to my father when we got home, but I didn't mind. To be honest, it made me kind of happy. Sometimes the three of us would go out bowling or to karaoke, and I began to realize that I was slowly becoming as stupid as they were and that there was actually something unusually pleasant about being stupid. I had even begun to think that I could be happy being nothing more than a member of this family of dummies. About six months after my father and she were married, Miyuki-san got pregnant. Since both the mother and father were dumb, it was pretty much a sure thing the child would be, too. Yet part of me was curious to see what kind of baby it would turn out to be given that half the blood flowing in its veins would be related to me. By that point I had come to feel that I was nothing more than a happy member of this stupid family. But I soon realized that I was the only one who felt that way. About a month before the due date, on the morning that she had placed an order for a crib, Miyuki-san made an announcement. I've talked this over with your father, and we've decided to make a study room for you in your grandmother's house. It would be hard to concentrate on your schoolwork with the baby crying. Don't worry, we're getting you a TV and an air conditioner. You'll see, it'll be great. It seemed that it had already been decided and that there was no room for discussion. The next week, a van from the store picked up everything from my room and took it to the old house by the river. Before the end of the day, a brand new crib had appeared in the sunny spot by the window in my old room. I could hear the pop of a tiny bubble bursting. Out here in the boondocks. There are no competitive schools. I was headed for our neighborhood middle school and had no need to study for entrance exams. As for the classes at elementary school, no matter what the subject, I could read the textbook through once to see what they were trying to teach us and then master the material in almost no time. I had no ambitions beyond that. In other words, I had no need for a study room. But there it was. So, in order to make good use of the space, and all this time I had on my hands, I decided to read the books my mother had bought me, even if I was starting a bit early. I'm not sure what my mother got out of crime and punishment and war and peace, but I felt that my own thoughts as I read must have been like hers, since the same blood ran through our veins. I loved all the books she had chosen, and read them over and over. As I read... I felt as though I was spending time with my mother, even though she was far away, and those were some of the few moments of happiness I had during those lonely times. My study room had once been used as a storehouse for our shops, and as I sat in there, alone with the memories of my mother, I began to look around and to discover what a treasure trove it was. I had nearly every electrician's tool imaginable, as well as broken or discarded electronics of all sorts. Among them, I found an old alarm clock, the same one my mother had taken apart to show me. I replaced the batteries but it still didn't run, so I decided to try to fix it. Once I had the back off, I could see that the problem was nothing more than a faulty contact, but as I made the repair, I hit upon an idea. My first invention, the backward clock. I rewired the hour hand and the minute hand and even the second hand to run backward and give the illusion that time had reversed course. I set the clock to midnight, and from that moment on I began calling the study room my laboratory. I was pleased with the backward clock, 
but it didn't elicit much of a response from my audience, which consisted of the idiots in my class who brought me their porn videos hoping I would agree to override the mosaic effect on the nasty parts. They would stare at the clock without realizing that the hands were running backward, and when at last I was forced to tell them, they would simply shrug. Oh, you're right, was the most I got out of them. One or two seemed a little more interested, but even these never thought to ask how I'd managed the reversal. Idiots like them believe that the world is limited to what they can see with their own eyes. They never try to figure out the inner working of things. That's why they're idiots and why they're so completely boring. When I showed it to my father, he simply asked whether it was broken. He was completely absorbed in doting over their new baby, which looked exactly like him and was just as dull-witted. My poor clock, my first invention, went completely unappreciated. But what would my mother say if I showed it to her? She alone would be able to see its genius and praise my achievement. I could barely contain my excitement at the thought. But how could I show it to her? I didn't know her address or telephone number. The only thing I did know was the name of the university where she was supposed to be working. So I decided at that point that the best strategy would be to set up my own website, which I dubbed the Genius Professor's Laboratory. If I presented my inventions there, perhaps my mother would see them and leave a comment at some point. I knew the chances were slim, but that was what I was hoping when I entered my web address on the comments page of the university site and left a message. Brilliant elementary school student who loves electrical engineering presents his fascinating inventions. Please have a look. But no matter how long I waited after that, there were never any comments that looked as though they might have been from my mother. The only visitors to the site were my idiot classmates, and when they mentioned that I could override the mosaic effect and uncensor porn, the number of hits from obvious perverts began to go up. Within three months, Genius Professor's Laboratory was nothing more than a hangout for twisted idiots. I tried posting some pictures of a dead dog I'd found down by the river, with the idea of scaring them off, but they seemed to love that even more, and the comments got weirder and weirder. Still, I never wanted to shut the site down, since that would have been cutting off my one chance of contacting my mother. I continued working on my inventions after I started middle school. Our homeroom teacher for 7th grade turned out to be a female science teacher. I actually kind of liked her, particularly because she was a little aloof and never tried to be too familiar with her students. That sort of attitude is pretty rare with teachers these days. I took her one of my new inventions, of which I was quite proud, my shocking coin purse. How would she react? I was really anxious to see, but what I got was the hysterics of an old hag. Why would you want to invent something so dangerous? What were you planning to do with it? Kill small animals? One of my idiot classmates must have told her about my website, but she was an even bigger idiot to take the pictures of the dog seriously. Disappointing. That was the only way to describe it. Right after this, however, I had a stroke of good luck, which came in the form of the National Middle School Science Fair. A poster announcing the competition appeared on the wall in the back of the classroom, with the names and titles of the six judges in small print. One was a science fiction writer, another a well-known politician, but what caught my eye was the name Yoshikazu Seguchi. Actually, I couldn't have cared less about the name, it was his title I noticed. He was listed as Professor of Electrical Engineering in the College of Science and Technology at K University the same K university where my mother was said to be working. If I entered an invention in the science fair and this professor noticed it, word of it might reach my mother's ears. Would she be surprised to hear my name? Would she be happy to know that her son had won a prize using the knowledge she had bequeathed him? And would she be moved to offer a word of congratulations to her long lost boy? I was in a frenzy after that. I've always had the ability to focus when I need to but I had never been so consumed by something in my life. First, I upgraded the coin purse by adding a release mechanism. 
but then I worked on the presentation values and the report, realizing that for a middle school project they probably looked at those even more carefully than they looked at the invention itself. Would they dismiss my purse as little more than a mechanized joke? Not if I could help it. I decided to bill it as a theft prevention device. I made sure that the diagrams and the explanatory paragraphs were perfect, but I also crafted the statement of purpose and project reflections to sound like something a middle school student would write. I even wrote it all out by hand rather than printing it off my computer. The finished product was 7th grade science nerd perfection. There was still one little problem. The application required a signature from the teacher who had served as your advisor, but Moriguchi had already told me what she thought of my purse. She must have been influenced by what she'd seen on my website, because she seemed shocked when I went to ask her to sign the form, but I had my line ready. I can assure you I made this with the purest of motives, but you seem to think it's too dangerous. Why don't we let the experts decide which one of us is right? In the end, she signed. After that, everything went according to plan. Over summer break, the shocking coin purse was entered in the local science fair in Nagoya and then went on to the national contest, where it was given honorable mention, the equivalent of third prize. I was a little disappointed at first, but in terms of my desired effect, third turned out to be even better than first. Judges were assigned to comment individually on each of the winning projects, and the judge for third place was none other than Professor Seguchi, the man from my mother's university. I take it you're Shu Yuotan Abi, he said, coming up to me as I stood by my display. This is quite an achievement. I don't think I could have built something like this myself. I've read your documentation, and I see you've applied a number of techniques you couldn't possibly have learned in middle school. Did your teacher help you with this? No, my mother did, I told him. Your mother? You certainly are a lucky boy. Well, I look forward to seeing what you'll come up with in the future. Good luck. He had used my full name and he absolutely had to know my mother. My fate was in this man's hands. I prayed that he would talk about what he'd seen today the next time he was with my mother. Or, if he didn't tell her, that he would at least leave the pamphlet listing the winner someplace she might find it. After the meeting with the judges, I was interviewed by a reporter from our local paper. It was unlikely she would run across an article in a paper from a small town far from where she was living, but perhaps if she learned about the prize from Seguchi, she might go online and find the article. I could always hope. The day I was interviewed, however, a seventh grade girl in some nowhere a town committed a crime. The lunacy incident. She put several different kinds of poison in the food her family was eating and then blogged about the effects. I have to admit I was the tiniest bit impressed once in a while one of these idiots comes up with an interesting idea. I waited for the rest of summer break, but there was no word from my mother. Since she didn't know my cell number, I hung around the store all day and ran to the phone every time it rang. Miyuki was used to having me out of her hair since I'd been spending all my time at the laboratory and she didn't seem very pleased. I was constantly checking my email on the store computer, and I ran out to the mailbox at the slightest sound. The TVs in the store played non-stop coverage of the lunacy incident. The girl's home environment, her behavior at school, her grades, the clubs she had belonged to, her hobbies, her favorite books and movies. If the TV was on, the details came pouring in. Had my mother learned of the prize I'd won in the science fair in spite of all the lunacy news? I found myself imagining her having coffee with Professor Seguchi in the university cafeteria. There was a kid at that science fair the other day. Shuyuotan Abi, I think his name was. WHO came up with an interesting invention. But that's preposterous. Why would they be talking about me? They were probably discussing the whole lunacy thing. As the coverage of that girl's idiotic crime grew more and more overwhelming, I had the feeling that bubbles were popping inside me. I'd done something wonderful and had my name printed in the newspaper, but my mother didn't know. But perhaps, just perhaps, if I did something horrible, 
my mother might come running to be with me again. So that's it, my early life and my hidden madness and my motive or at least the motive for my first crime. Crimes, like anything else, come in all sizes and shapes. Shoplifting, theft, assault, but petty stuff like that gets you nothing more than a lecture from the police or a teacher, and if they wanted to blame anyone else, it would be my father or Miyuki. And what would be the point in that? And I despise pointless things more than anything else in this world. If you're going to commit a crime, it ought to be something that can get people talking, whip the media into a frenzy which means there's only one crime that will do, and that's murder. So I could steal a knife from the kitchen, run through the streets waving it around and screaming like a madman, and then stab the lady at the deli. That would get a lot of attention, no doubt, but when they went to find somebody to blame, again they would cite bad parenting from my father or Miyuki. What good would it do to have the newspapers writing about the influence those two had on my character development? What could be more humiliating than seeing my father on TV saying how sorry he was he'd sent me off to my study room instead of keeping me at home? No, I had to get them to blame my mother. That was the only way to be sure she'd come to see me. When I'd done my deed, I needed to find a way to get the eyes of the world to turn toward her. But what did we have in common? Our genius, of course. So my crime had to somehow demonstrate the intelligence and ability I inherited from him. Which meant it had to involve one of my inventions. Should I come up with something new? Or was there something lying around that might work? Again, the answer was simple. The shocking coin purse. Professor Seguchi had made the necessary connection himself at the award ceremony. Did your teacher help you with this? No. My mother did, I had told him. When a murder is committed, some of the attention naturally goes to the murder weapon. Knives or bats are boring. Even the lunacy girl's potassium cyanide could be ordered online or stolen from school. In other words, the crime had relied on these tools without leaving room to demonstrate the murderer's own ability. What would they say when they found out my weapon was something I'd invented myself? Not to mention that it had won a prize at the National Middle School Science Fair, the most wholesome place imaginable. That would get them talking. The judges who had awarded the prize would have some explaining to do, and at that point Seguchi might even mention that it was my mother who had inspired my technical wizardry. But even if that whole scenario was unlikely, I was pretty sure my father would mention my mother's influence if he thought it would help him avoid responsibility for what I'd done. But I suppose I didn't have to worry about all this. I could always just make the connection myself. Tell them that instead of reading me fairy tales my mother had taught me electrical engineering from the time I was small. I could imagine the outcry that would follow my confession. But what would my mother have to say? She'd tell me she was sorry, as she had all those times before, and then hold me in her arms. I was sure of it. So now that I'd decided on the weapon, I just needed a victim. As a middle school student in a dead-end town, I didn't get around much. My spheres of activity were limited to 1. Home 2. My laboratory and 3. School As I've said before, if I committed the murder at home or at my father's shop, the blame would fall on him rather than on my mother, even if it were committed with one of my inventions. I suppose I might have chosen one of the kids who played by the river near the lab, but in fact the place had a bad reputation and kids didn't come all that often, so it wouldn't be possible to plan things as carefully as I'd like. That left school. Which was fine, since murders at school always seem to get a lot of coverage in the media. So, who should it be? The truth is, I didn't really care. I wasn't interested in the idiots and bumpkins in my class. I hardly knew their names and I didn't think the media coverage would be much different whether I chose a student or a teacher. They'd go crazy for either one. Middle school student kills teacher. Middle school student kills classmate. They both sounded pretty good. But also a little boring at the same time. I was thinking about what made a person want to commit murder in the first place, 
What brought out the killer instinct when I suddenly remembered the kid who sits next to me in class and scrails, die, 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 in his notebook. He's a pathetic piece of work, so worthless I'd been tempted to lean over and tell him he's the one who should die. But now it occurred to me to wonder who it was he wanted to kill. Maybe I should get him to pick my victim. On the other hand, that wasn't the only reason I ended up talking to him in the first place. There was another element missing in my plan. A witness. What good was the murder if no one realized I'd done it? And yet, it would look too foolish to turn myself in. I needed someone who could follow me through the plan from beginning to end and then give a full account to the police or the media. But not just anyone would do. First of all, I had to avoid anyone with a highly developed sense of morality. I also had to avoid anyone who might let the cat out of the bag while I was walking him through the plot. And, finally, I needed someone who wasn't categorically opposed to murder. But there were other considerations besides. I had to avoid anyone who thought of himself as happier than me. Some kids, when they see someone worse off than they are, want to play therapist. Why would you want to go and kill somebody? You must be unhappy about something. Why don't you tell me all about it? What would I do if someone started that routine with me? The whole thing is just a trick, a way for them to make themselves feel better. Fortunately, it wasn't hard to figure out the likely candidates. A week of observing my classmates gave me a good sense of who was who. I had to avoid the complete idiots and the hangers on seeking reflected glory. Then there were the idiots who had watched me decrypt their porn tapes but then went around acting like they could do it themselves. Or they would be thugs who wanted to think of themselves as bad boys when the worst they'd ever done was visit my website and ogle the pictures of dead animals. I couldn't have the witness claiming he was actually my accomplice. The ideal subject was an idiot. They were all idiots who was harboring some deep resentment but was too timid to let it out and Naoki Shitamura fit the bill exactly. At the beginning of February I succeeded in increasing the charge in the shocking coin purse. The time had come to put my plan into action. I had never said more than two words to Shitamura, but as soon as I tapped him on the shoulder and buttered him up a bit, he opened right up. It was really quite simple. I mentioned the porn videos to him and the deal was sealed. But almost immediately I began to regret having chosen Shitamura as the witness. To begin with, I quickly figured out that he didn't have somebody he wanted to kill. He was just generally unhappy, and he scribbled, die, 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 over and over because his limited vocabulary didn't afford him any other options to express his feelings. But beyond that he was simply depressing to be around. At school he was quiet enough but give him an opening and he babbled on endlessly. Try one of these carrot cookies. Oh, I bet you're like me dot can't stand carrots. I'm the same way. I won't touch them except in these cookies. My mom tried all these different recipes to get me to eat carrots, but they all sucked. But then she came up with these and they're really not bad dot like I'm willing to eat them dot f o r her sake. I had no idea what he was talking about. It was a bit creepy for the mother of a middle school kid to send cookies along when her son went to play at another kid's house, which is why I hadn't touched them in the first place, but it was even creepier for the son to take them and not be totally embarrassed. It occurred to me that I should just kill him and be done with it. I did, however, have a useful realization in the midst of all of this. Human beings have a fundamental need for physical and emotional space, and the desire to extinguish another life can arise when the boundaries of that space are violated. But just as I was beginning to think about finding another witness, Shitamura mentioned a target that had never occurred to me, Moriguchi's little girl. Middle school student kills teacher's daughter right at school. That would be a first, and the TV and newspapers would eat it up. The homeroom teacher who had abused the boy when he showed her his invention. The same teacher who had signed the application to the science fair. Her little girl. Not bad for an idiot like Shitamura. He even provided some additional information that could be of use. 
He had been shopping at the mall and had seen the girl begging Moriguchi for a pouch in the shape of a rabbit dot which she had refused to buy her. I decided to keep Shitamura on as witness. He got very excited about the plan, which he thought would end with the girl getting a little shock. He even started adding details, insisting, for instance, that someone needed to scout out the scene of the crime before we got started. The more I let him rattle on, the more eager he got. I wonder if she's going to cry. He would say, with a revolting grin on his face. What do you think? Will she? I doubt it, I told him. Because she'll be dead. It was all I could do to keep from laughing myself sick at the sight of him making his little plans with no idea how they would end. Enjoy yourself while you can. You won't be grinning when you see her dead on the ground in front of you. He'd go running straight home, scared out of his mind, and tell his mother. That would be perfect. Especially since I remembered having heard that she was always complaining to someone about something. Apparently she wrote to the principal at the drop of a hat about any little slight to her boy. Well, I was going to give her something much bigger to worry about. Everything was in place. The afternoon in question, I got a text from Shitamura saying that he had done his reconnaissance, and I headed over to the pool. He continued his annoying monologue while we hid in the locker room and waited for the girl. He would get his mother to bake a cake so we could celebrate, he said. What I didn't say was that I would never speak to him again once we were finished here, but the more he talked, the more I wanted to find a way to hurt him. But what could have been simpler? I just had to tell him the truth. As I was enjoying imagining the near future, our victim arrived. She was four years old at the time, an intelligent-looking girl who bore a close resemblance to her mother. She looked warily about her but walked straight across the pool deck to the fence where the dog was waiting. Then she produced a piece of bread from under her sweatshirt and began feeding it to the dog piece by piece. I had imagined a more pitiful child, given that she was the daughter of a single mother, but I realized immediately that I'd been wrong. Her pink sweatshirt was printed with her favorite rabbit character. Her hair was neatly parted in the middle and held back on either side with bands decorated with pom-poms. Her cheeks were soft and white. When she smiled at the dog, I felt as though I was looking at the fluffy rabbit thing come to life. She was obviously a well-loved child, at least to my eyes. It's embarrassing to admit it, but at that moment I envied my victim. A little girl who should have been nothing more than a necessary piece, an object, in my plan. But I managed to shrug off this humiliation and go out to meet her. Shitamura followed and then pushed past me. Hi, he said as we got close to her. You're Manami, aren't you? We're in your mother's class. You remember, I saw you the other day at Happy Town. He'd jumped in and gotten things started. To be honest, I hadn't really thought he'd be any good at this stage of the game, but he actually was the first to speak up. He'd even thought up his line, and since his only real strength was his ability to seem friendly, this should have been a decent plan, but in the end it proved to be a disaster. When he spoke to the girl, he sounded exactly like the third-rate MC they hired once a year for the block party in our neighborhood. He might have pulled it off if he'd used his normal voice, but instead he sounded like somebody pretending to be the nice boy from next door. The girl was eyeing him suspiciously now, and I knew I would have to do something or the whole plan would be ruined. It was my turn to speak up. Shit Amra could just watch from here on. I asked her about the dog, and she got a big smile on her face. Humans truly are simple creatures. Then I watched for an opening and produced the pouch. It's a little early, but it's a Valentine's present from your mother. I hung it around her neck. From Mama, she said, and I could see that she had the smile of someone who had been well loved, the smile I had lost forever. That's when I realized I wanted her to die. I wanted to escape this humiliation, and the murder that would allow me to do it seemed even more precious. My plan suddenly appeared utterly perfect. Go ahead and open it, I told her. There's chocolate inside. There was a look of complete trust in her eyes as she took hold of the zipper. There was a quiet popping sound, 
her body twitched violently, and she fell over on her back. After that she lay perfectly still, with her eyes closed. It had all happened so quickly that my bubble had no time to pop. She was dead. My plan was a success. My mother would come now. She would take me in her arms and apologize for all the pain she'd caused me, and we'd never have to be apart again. I was on the verge of tears, but Shitamura brought me back to reality. He was clinging to me and his body was trembling, which was totally disgusting. Go ahead, tell everybody all about it. Once I told him the most important thing, I shook him off and turned to leave. I have nothing more to say to you, but your part begins now. This is the only reason I spoke to an idiot like you in the first place. Why I took you to my laboratory and let you leave your nasty cookie crumbs all over. But then I turned around. Shitamura was still standing there, a stunned look on his face. Oh, I almost forgot. Don't worry about them thinking you had anything to do with this. We've never been friends. I can't stand kids like you anyway. Completely worthless but full of yourself. Compared to a genius like me, you're pretty much a complete failure. How well put. There was something refreshing about finally telling the truth. I turned again, and this time I left the pool without looking back and went straight to the laboratory. Everything had gone according to plan. I spent the night at the lab waiting for my phone to ring or to hear the police on the intercom, but at dawn the next day nothing had happened. Apparently Shitamura hadn't gone sniveling to his mother yet hardly surprising, as he was slow at everything. But they must have found the body by now. There was nothing on the TV or the internet, so I decided to go by the house on the way to school to read the morning paper. I had stopped eating breakfast the long ago, but Miyuki said I should at least have a glass of milk. I drank it down and then spread the newspaper on the dining room table. On any other morning I would have started with the front page headlines, but this morning I went straight to the local news. Four-year-old girl drowns after sneaking into pool to feed dog. Drowns? I went on to the article, certain there must have been a mistake. Around 6.30 on the afternoon of the 13th, the body of man Ami Moriguchi, four-year, daughter of Yuko Moriguchi, was discovered in the pool at S Municipal Middle School. The police are still investigating the cause of death, but it is believed to have been an accidental drowning. Accidental. Where still, there was no mention of electrocution. She had drowned. What had happened? As I was trying to sort things out, Miyuki let out a gasp. Why, this is your school, isn't it? And Yuko Moriguchi.is your teacher. Her little girl died. As I write this now, I can see myself at that moment and remember that I knew Miyuki was saying something important, but somehow nothing was getting through to me. It was only slowly dawning on me that Shitamuri must have done something that made a mess of things. I hurried off to school to find out what had really happened. Up to that point I had thought that the word failure had nothing to do with me or my life. I was supposed to know how to avoid it, which mainly meant not getting involved with idiots. But I had completely forgotten this lesson in choosing my witness. School was buzzing with talk of the girl's death. The body had been discovered by Hoshino, one of the boys in our class, and he was telling anyone who would listen how he'd found it floating in the pool. The pool had nothing to do with it, I told myself. I wanted to tell those idiots that she was killed by Shuya Watanabe's prize-winning invention. So why didn't I? The answer was simple. They didn't think it was a murder at all. Everyone was convinced it was an accident. The plan had been a massive failure. Not wanting to be seen as my accomplice, that coward Shitamura had thrown her in the pool to make it look as though she had drowned. I was furious. But even more so when he showed up at school looking cool and calm, as though he hadn't done anything, hadn't ruined my plan. I dragged him out to the hall and demanded an explanation. Leave me alone, he hissed. We've never been friends, remember? But you should know that I'm not going to tell anybody about yesterday. If you want to, go ahead. That was when I realized he hadn't thrown the body in the pool because he was frightened. 
He'd done it expressly to spoil my plan. But why? The answer was simple. To get back at me for what I'd said as I walked away. I'd underestimated him. A cornered rat will bite the cat, and there were idiots all over Japan doing unimaginable things simply because someone had pushed them too far. It was my own fault. I had given in to my emotions for one moment and provoked this idiot. But in the end it didn't matter. I'd lost nothing. Nothing had changed. I could go back to being a model student for the time being while I worked on a new plan. That ought to have been the end of it. But it wasn't. The victim's mother, Moriguchi, found out the truth. About a month later, she called me to the science room and showed me the rabbit pouch, which was now dirty but intact. My wonderful invention, my murder weapon. I had succeeded after all. I wanted to shout for joy. I confessed everything. I had wanted to kill someone with my invention, to attract even more attention than the lunacy girl. But Shitamura, my witness, had lost his nerve and had thrown the body in the pool. I told her how sorry I was that no one had found out. To be honest, I did everything I could to provoke her that day so much so that I'm surprised, looking back on it, that she didn't kill me right on the spot. But I really didn't have much choice. It was my one chance to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. But she just listened to the whole thing and then announced that she wasn't going to tell the police. She wasn't going to give me the satisfaction of starring in my own horror show. But why? Why? Why did all these idiots insist on getting in my way? Why all the recalcitrant pieces and parts? Whatever the reason, she did as she'd said and kept quiet about the whole thing. Then, on the last day of the school year, she announced that she was retiring from teaching, and as her parting message to us she began explaining exactly what had happened to her daughter. I wasn't sure why she was telling all those idiots when she hadn't said anything to the police, but at the very least it wasn't a boring goodbye. She overacted a bit in places, but on the whole it made a pretty gripping story. As she got closer to revealing the identity of her daughter's killer, the other kids in the class started crooning around to look at me. Their stares filled me with a deep feeling of satisfaction. There were worse ways of getting this started than having the room run through the school that I was a murderer. But then one of the idiots asked her why she hadn't gone to the authorities, whether she would feel responsible if were killed again. Her answer came as a shock. But you misunderstand when you worry about a killing again. I knew every detail of the incident. But I have to admit at that moment I had no idea what she was saying. The purse was incapable of stopping the heart of an old person with coronary disease, or even that of a four-year-old child. She was saying that my invention hadn't worked, that Shitamura had killed the girl instead of me. I had simply rendered her unconscious. She had died when that idiot dropped her in the pool under the mistaken impression that he needed to cover up what we'd done. At that instant, Every eye in the room turned toward Shit Amura. How utterly humiliating. Nothing could be worse. I wanted to bite off my tongue and die on the spot. But there was one more detail in Moriguchi's story, an especially interesting one. She had mixed the blood of an AIDS patient into the milk Shit Amura and I had just drunk. If I'd been as much of an idiot as my partner in crime, I might have stood up from my desk and yelled, Bravo. From the moment I first realized I was holding my mother back, I had contemplated suicide any number of times. But I'd been too young to come up with the right way to do it. I recalled praying over and over for exactly this, please let me get sick. Now I'd been granted my wish in a most unexpected fashion. It was beyond anything I could have imagined, a complete success. If my mother would have come running to help her son accused of murder, she was even more likely to come for one who had AIDS. I was jumping for joy on the inside, as cliché as that might seem. I wanted to run right to the doctor to get certification that I was HIV positive and then send it off to the university where my mother was working, but I knew the virus could take three months to show up in my system, so I would have to wait to be tested. As frustrating as it was, that was all I could do. In reality, however, 
I don't think I'd known such a peaceful period since my mother left. Under normal circumstances, my father would probably not have approved of my seeing my mother, but if I were ill, he would have no choice. I might even be allowed to live out my last days with her. The incubation period for AIDS can be 5 or even 10 years. We could develop a joint research project at her university. What kind of amazing things could the two of us do together? Then, when I was too sick to carry on with the research, she would nurse me on my deathbed. As I played out this scenario in my head, vacation ended and the new school year started. Shitamura didn't show up for class, and the rest of the idiots left me alone for fear of catching the virus, so all in all it was actually quite pleasant. Gradually, however, the idiots began their little campaign of stupid pranks. They would shove milk cartons in my desk or shoe cupboard, or hide my gym clothes, or write die on my books. It wasn't fun, but I have to admit I was almost impressed by their determination and sense of invention in coming up with the would-be indignities. At one point, when a carton of sour milk exploded in my desk, I had a passing desire to slaughter the lot of them, but even that I could forgive or at least ignore when I realized it was just a matter of time before I would be with my mother. When the three months had finally passed, I went to a clinic in the next town to have blood drawn for the test. Then, a week after that, I had a run-in with the class clowns. They're idiots, but even idiots can be dangerous in a group. As school was letting out, they grabbed me from behind and bound my hands and feet with tape. They had come prepared with surgical masks and rubber gloves to avoid infection. I thought they were going to kill me, and under other circumstances I might not have minded. But now I didn't want to die. Not yet, anyway. Not when my dream was just about to come true. If I started crying and asked for forgiveness, they might let me go. If I got down on my knees and begged, I might escape with my life. I was so determined to live that I would have put up with any humiliation. But as it turned out, I wasn't even the target that day. They were really after the class president, who was suspected of having squealed to Torada, the new homeroom teacher. They had a special treat worked out for her. When she insisted she was innocent, they told her to prove it by throwing a milk carton at me. It hit me in the face and exploded in a magnificent shower, but the shock reminded me of something completely different. I could feel my mother's hand on all those occasions when she slapped me. I don't know what kind of expression I had on my face, but at that moment my eyes met the president's mazookas and I saw her mouth the words, I'm sorry. Someone else must have seen her, too, because they declared her guilty and immediately passed sentence. A kiss. Apparently, that was why they had tied me up in the first place. I had spent the walk home after this encounter wondering how there could be so many stupid human beings in the world, but those thoughts disappeared as I got to the door and saw an envelope from the clinic in the mailbox. At last, but the moment I ripped it open, I could feel myself tumbling into the abyss. It was negative. I was negative. I didn't have AIDS. I had known that was possible. So why had I been so sure I'd test positive? I suppose because Moriguchi had been so convincing that day. I began to regret that the idiots hadn't just killed me earlier at school. Late that evening, I sent a text to Mizuki asking her to meet me. I sent it because I had been unable to throw away the useless scrap of paper that had been waiting in the mailbox. It was useless to me. But it might be the difference between life and death for a girl who had been forced to kiss someone she was convinced had AIDS. But to be honest, that was an afterthought. The truth is, I didn't want to be alone, and there was something about her that had interested me if only slightly before any of this happened. It had something to do with the fact that I had seen her at the pharmacy trying to buy some chemicals. They had refused to sell them to her, even though she said she wanted them for some dye work she was doing. I realized I could have made a bomb from the stuff she had wanted, and I wondered whether she might have had the same thing in mind. Was there someone she wanted dead? If so, I even imagined we might hit it off. But when she showed up for my little meeting and I held out the results of my blood test, her reaction was a surprise. 
I knew, she said. But how could she have known my HIV status before I did myself? Maybe she meant she had read up on the transmission of the HIV virus and knew that the likelihood of infection from Moriguchi's little trick was extremely low. But when I took her to the laboratory and we sat down to talk, she had a completely different explanation. Apparently, Moriguchi had never put the blood in the cartons in the first place. Mizuki had been the last one in the classroom the day Moriguchi told us a goodbye story, and she had found my empty carton and shatamaras in the rack. She had taken them home and tested them with some chemicals she said she'd managed to get hold of. It seemed I had been under Moriguchi's spell the whole time. I'd been living in a fantasy of my own devising. But why had Moriguchi gone to such trouble and told such a complicated lie? In the end, she hadn't turned us in or given us AIDS. What did her revenge amount to? Maybe she had only meant to torture us psychologically. If that were the case, I suppose you could say she'd hit a home run with Shitamura. I've forgotten to mention that he stabbed his mother to death and then went a little crazy. They say the police still haven't been able to question him. But Moriguchi couldn't have predicted that the day she gave her performance in front of the class. The thing that surprises me, however, is that a mom-ass boy like Shitamura never told his mother he'd been infected with HIV. I'd have guessed he'd go right home and tell her, there's in his eyes, and then they'd have made daily trips to the clinic while they were waiting for the test results. If Moriguchi was gambling on driving him crazy instead of actually killing him, she knew what she was up to. But what about me? I suppose it's true that Shitamura was the one who actually killed her daughter, but if I hadn't made the plan, she'd still be alive. I can't imagine she doesn't hate me just as much as Shitamura. Nor can I believe that she was smart enough to realize how disappointed I'd be that I'm not HIV positive. At any rate, whatever she was thinking, it was all a failure. A big bore, like everything else. It's boring to go on living but just as boring to kill yourself. I suddenly realized I needed some fun, a diversion of some sort. Maybe I should find a way to pay back all those idiots at school. First I needed to make sure they still believed I had AIDS. The next day I staged a return engagement of the little drama they had scripted for the president and me the day before. It was all over in five minutes, and I found myself thanking Moriguchi for her parting gift to me. So, you may be wondering at this point why I planted the bomb. I want to warn you against easy explanations, and you certainly shouldn't assume that it had anything to do with Mizuki becoming my girlfriend or that I was trying to compensate for my mother's love. I hesitate to write about Mizuki here, but I will in order to avoid any inaccurate assumptions. She is certainly bright enough, and she isn't silly like a lot of girls. There's nothing special about the way she looks, but there was nothing wrong with her, either. But none of that had anything to do with why I liked her. What I liked, even admired, about her was the fact that she stayed cool after Moriguchi's performance. While everybody else, and, I'm embarrassed to say, that included me, fell hook, line, and sinker for her grap, Mizuki showed the skeptical spirit of a scientist and tried to confirm those wild claims. But even when she found out the truth, she didn't go around telling everybody. She kept it to herself. That's why I like her. In fact, I like her so much I was willing to stoop to pretty pathetic tactics to get her to like me back. I just wanted someone to notice me, I told her. Of course, it wasn't someone I wanted. It was my mother. But still, the line seemed to work with Mizuki. Unfortunately, she turned out to be a complete idiot. Or maybe it would be more accurate to say she was a fool. During summer vacation, she would come to the lab every day, and while I worked on my new invention, she sat hunched over her laptop tapping out something on the keyboard. When I asked her what she was writing, she refused to tell me, and I let it go at that. I suppose she was my girlfriend at that point. But listening to someone else's little problems was still more trouble than it was worth. She finally told me that she'd been writing something to submit to a literary contest. That was a week ago today, the day she sent the whole thing off in the mail. 
I told her I'd first noticed her when I realized she had those chemicals. I thought she might be interested in science, and that had made me want to get to know her. But as soon as she heard this, she began explaining the real reason she had them, as though she'd been waiting all along for the chance to tell me her secret. She wasn't planning to make a bomb. But they weren't for some craft project, either. Nor was she planning to poison someone. Or kill herself. She was simply obsessed with the lunacy girl and what she'd done. When the news first broke, she had immediately been convinced that the girl was her other self. The name itself was proof enough, she said, Luna meant Moon, as did Zuki, the second character of her name. She went on like this for a long time, but none of it made any sense. When I didn't say anything, she just kept talking. She told me that there were other things that proved she and the lunacy girl were one and the same person. When they published the list of the chemicals the girl had in her possession in one of the weeklies, she had been speechless. They were exactly the same ones that she, Mizuki, had collected. For what it's worth, that list had already been published when I spotted her trying to buy things at the pharmacy. It's hard to know whether she was telling the truth, but she said she used one of the chemicals she had on hand to test the milk cartons for traces of blood, so at least they turned out to be good for something. At one point, out of the blue, she suggested testing some of her stock on Torada. There was something gloomy about her, like a character in a bad after-school special, not that I've ever seen one, but I doubt she could have murdered anyone. Still, when the police questioned her about the incident with Shitamura and his mother, she blamed Tarada for everything and it seemed as though she still wasn't satisfied. But the whole thing struck me as a bit much. I could almost find myself sympathizing with the poor guy. He had been unlucky enough to take over from Moriguchi and then had let her prod him into the Shitamura debacle. But when I asked her why she had it in for Tarada, her answer was unforgivable. I hate him because of what he did to Naoki. He was the first boy I ever loved. But I like you now, Shuya. She was putting me on the same level as Shitamura. Could anything be more humiliating? Shit. How stupid can you be? I had thought I'd said this to myself, but apparently I said it aloud. Then, since it didn't matter anymore, I told her exactly what I thought of her obsession with the lunacy thing. By that point she was furious, and she accused me of having a mother complex. I had told her a good bit of what I've written here, but it was wrong of her to describe it that way. Then when I tried to tell her that, she just pressed her point. I'm sure your mother loved you, but she made a hard choice in order to pursue her dream and she left you. She must have had her reasons, but in the end that's what it comes down to, you were left behind. But if you miss her that much, why don't you just go see her? Tokyo is not that far away, and you know where she works. The only reason you're still waiting for her is that you're a coward. You're afraid she'll send you away. You figured out long ago that she doesn't want you anymore. That was too much. It wasn't just me she was attacking, it was my mother. The next thing I knew, I had my hands wrapped around her scrawny neck. At last I found myself truly wanting to kill someone and there was no time to consider the weapon. There was nothing waiting on the other side of this murder. In other words, this was an end in itself, murder as its own reward. She died too quickly for me to hear the bubble pop. Shitamra's experience had shown me that no one would pay much attention just because a minor committed murder. I decided her death was of no use to me and I hid the body away in the laboratory's outsized refrigerator. But after a week, when no one came looking for her, I began to see how pitiful she was and thought I would take her with me the next day when I went to set off the bomb. After all, I had made it with her chemicals. She had brought them here to the lab because, she said, they seemed to go with the place. In the end, though, I had to give up on the idea of carting her to school. Life may be as fragile and light as a bubble, but a body had turned into a lump of lead. But again, I want to be perfectly clear. Planting the bomb has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I killed the class president.
Three days ago I went to K University to see my mother. All along I had wanted her to come to me. But as one of the conditions of the divorce settlement, she had promised not to contact me, and, being the serious person she was, the promise had kept her away all these years. Now I was taking matters into my own hands and making it possible for mother and son to meet again. It took just four hours to get to the university, first on a local train, then the Shinkansen, and finally the subway. It had always seemed like another world, a paradise that could never be reached, but here I was after a short, easy trip. Still, as I got near my destination I could feel my chest tighten. I began to find it difficult to breathe. Laboratory number 3 in the Electrical Engineering Department of the College of Science and Technology at K University. My mother's laboratory. As I crossed the enormous campus, my brain was running through various reunion scenarios. I would knock on the door of the lab, and my mother would answer. What kind of look would she have on her face when she saw me? What would she say? She probably wouldn't say anything, just hug me tight. But what if one of her assistants or a student answered instead? I'd tell them I was here to see Professor John Yasaka. And then should I give my name? Or just wait for her to see me? I was still trying to figure this out when I reached the electrical engineering department and ran into someone I might have expected to meet here. Professor Seguchi, the judge from the science fair. Oddly enough, he seemed to remember me and spoke up first. This is a surprise, he said. To what do we owe the pleasure? For some reason I couldn't bring myself to say that I'd come to see my mother, so I blurted out the first thing that came into my head. I had an errand nearby and I decided to come and see whether you might be here. Well, I'm delighted you did. So, have you brought along another invention? I have, I told him. Several, in fact. Nor was this a lie. I had brought the shocking purse and the backward clock and my lie detector to show my mother. Professor Seguchi smiled and led me off toward his lab, which was at the eastern end of the building on the third floor and right under mother's. Once I had shown him the inventions, I could tell him I had actually come to see her. He would say, you're John Yasakus boy. No wonder you're so smart. As all this was running through my head. We reached his lab and he showed me into a room that embodied all my fantasies. Complex instruments crammed into every corner, shelves overflowing with books and technical journals. He sat me down on the couch and went to get me a cold drink. My eyes wandered around the room until they came to rest on a framed photograph on his desk. The picture showed Professor Seguchi and a woman standing in front of an old castle, perhaps in Germany. The woman next to the professor, who was smiling so happily, was clearly Dot M.Y. Mother. But what could this mean? Maybe it had been taken while they were at a conference together or on a research trip. Even after Professor Seguchi put the drink down on the table in front of me, I couldn't take my eyes off the picture. He seemed to notice and laughed bashfully. I'm afraid to say it was taken on our honeymoon. A bubble popped. Honeymoon? I know. You might think I'm too old for that kind of thing. But we were married last autumn, and now at 50 I'm about to become a father for the first time. Strange, isn't it? A father. The baby's due at the end of December. But my wife doesn't seem to care she's off at a conference in Fukuoka today. Women are like that now. Bubbles popping, one after the other. Dot your wife is Professor John Yasaka, isn't she? Yes. Do you know her? She's dot someone I greatly respect. I had started trembling, and that was all I could manage to say. The last bubble was gone. Seguchi was eyeing me suspiciously. You're not her. I didn't wait around to hear the end of his sentence. I leapt up and ran out of the room. Though I never looked back, I was pretty sure the professor had made no move to follow me. I thought she had given up on the idea of a family in exchange for the chance to follow her dream, to be true to her gift. To become a great inventor, she's been forced to abandon her beloved child. Her one and only child. Isn't that what she'd said? But she had never come back to find her one and only. 
Instead, she'd married up, found a better mate, had another child, and was living happily ever after. It had been four years since she'd left me, but I'd finally realized the truth. It wasn't a child in the abstract that had held her back. It was me, Shuya, a boy with a name, and from the day she walked out of the house, I was already a thing of the past. Already fading from memory. I was sure that Seguchi had realized who I was, so the fact that there was no word from her after my visit made this all too clear. So you can think of the mass murder I am about to commit as my revenge against my mother and this last will and testament as the only way I have to tell her what I've done. As with Moriguchi's daughter, I need a witness this time as well. So I've appointed you, the visitors to my website. I hope you will be watching as I create a catastrophe that will go down in the annals of juvenile crime, and I hope you will tell my mother it was my way of showing her my pain. Farewell. Farewell. I pounded on the podium as I finished reading Life, my stupid essay and then reached into my pocket for my phone. The number was preset. I slowly pressed the send button, that is, the detonator for my bomb. One second passed, two, three, four, five. Nothing happened. What could have gone wrong? Was the bomb a dud? No. I hadn't even heard the vibration from the other phone I'd wired in as a trigger. It couldn't be. I bent over and peered under the podium. The bomb was gone. Someone must have seen the website and removed it. But who? It was a delicate business disarming a bomb. And why hadn't they called the police? Could it be dot my mother? Just then the phone in my hand started ringing. Number withheld. My finger was trembling as I pressed talk.